unaccept an Anthony or reject him after you've already been accepted. Not going somewhere we don't want to. So he's been dealing with that, the haters. Oh, the world. Because of the way that he has to rest. Stop, stop, stop. I hate this school so much. And I can't go here because I'm not 100% perfect. I can't go school with your kids when you're telling me. You said it's telling me it's not fair. I think we have an obligation to treat him as we would any of the rest of them. I know it hurts. I've been there. Anthony doesn't really try to hide his blindness. He wants to be independent. He wants to be like any other kid. It's two! It's two! It's two! It's two! There's no more. I'm not losing to a bunch of kids. That's not the subject anymore. You are a great wrestler, man. I've been the recipient of a lot of kids upsetting people, and I've also been the recipient of kids getting knocked off. We all got a lot in the picture. My goal is for my senior year are to get over 123 wins, to win districts, win regions, and win states. I don't even want to lose a high school match again. No doubt in my mind, he's got it in. I, do it back. I, do it back. I plan on being the first blind state champion. If all goes well, Anthony should accomplish that goal. I really don't see why he wouldn't. Come on, come on. So, my parents had to figure out what the best thing to do for me was. They weren't going to treat me any differently. I'm the youngest of five, and I think I'm number 23 of 60 cousins on my mom's side. Uh, my mom's the second oldest of 13, so they all grew up in Monmouth County, uh, so I wasn't treated any differently. I grew up skateboarding. I grew up, uh, you know, surfing with my brothers. I rode bikes until I started hitting parked cars, and I was like, thanks, stop. Um, so, I started, uh, my parents found a school in Philadelphia called St. Lucie Day School for the Blind, and that's where they sent me for up until sixth grade to learn how to read Braille, write in Braille, do everything you do to, you know, get in the mainstream world, but do it a little differently. And I started going there, and seventh grade comes along, so it's time for me to transfer back to Spring Lake, where I grew up, and to go to the public school. So I was traveling two hours every day back and forth, wake up, at, leave at 6, get back at 4.30, and by like 5th, 6th grade, I was getting pretty lazy, just being, you know, as a blind kid, I'd get home, it'd be dark, and I'd just feel sorry for myself, I'd like watch TV really close, like two inches away from the screen, and eat junk food, and finally my brothers, who were a big impact in my life, Ollie and John, uh, both my older brothers, they said to me, you know, they were getting worried because I was just like chubby kid, unmotivated, and they're like, eh, you're blind. You can't be blind that fat. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you gotta figure something out. Like, you gotta do it. We, 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 uh, we believe in you. So, you know, I couldn't do like football. I wanted to play football so bad. I was like, Dad, let me play football. Let me play football. He's like, No, you're gonna get blindsided. So, <laughs> I guess I can't play football. And both. So my brother Oliver, he was a heck of a wrestler. He took fifth in the state at Christian Brothers Academy in New Jersey, state New Jersey. And I looked up to him. He was like bigger than life to me. You know, I was like. Well, you know, Ollie's out there doing it. I remember going to all his matches as a kid. Like, I'm gonna try wrestling. So I, I go uh, seventh grade, first day of practice. I go and 
I'm awful. Like I was, it was, it was really sad. I went three and ten my first year in seventh grade, and two of my wins was forfeits. So you just go out. And, get an <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, at the end of the season. I was in the end of the year match, like the end of the year tournament, and you know, I, was, I thought I was gonna win it because I'm just like, I'm gonna win. And I'm in the match and I'm losing. I, I'm like doing okay against the kid, I end up losing. And after the match, I, my season's over, and I remember walking out of the gym so mad. I said to my dad, I was like, Dad, I need to find a club. Like, I, I'm not just gonna be mediocre at this. I can't just be, you know, like subpar or whatever. I wanna be good at this. And he, at first he took it as, you know, I'm just, I just lost, so just feeling sorry for myself, I want to get better, blah, blah, it's going to be over in a couple of weeks. But I don't stop asking him, I'm like, Dad, Dad, where's that club? And finally he finds one, he's like, alright, i got to look it up. He emails this guy from uh, Wall Township, Mike Bonacanto, at this club, Rhino Wrestling Club, and he said, you know, my, my son, he's uh, 160 pounds, he's in 7th grade, uh, just started wrestling, great weight, he works hard. Would you consider training him? Oh, one more thing, he's blind. The guy might throw it back the first thing, he's like, awesome, like, let's do it, you know? And he took the challenge right away. And I remember going every day, Monday through Thursday, to these practices after school, and just, you know, working hard. It's the first time I learned what pit stains were, like, working hard. And I just remember going out of practice, like, okay, I have a lot to work on, you know, I'm at the bottom, but I, I gotta come up somewhere, and I'm not gonna stop. So I just kept going and practicing and practicing my butt off. And I started going to tournaments every weekend. And I'll never forget the first like couple months of tournaments, it was always the same bracket. And it was me, who has no business being there, and then three or four like national champions in like Greco and freestyle wrestling. So it was really intimidating. So my goals, you know, I was getting manhandled. I wasn't even scoring points at these tournaments. And my goal, I switched. Instead of trying to win these matches, I'm going to start with little goals. So I'm going to try and score a point, you know. And then these things started happening. I started accomplishing these little goals. So I started start to work towards the bigger goal. And next thing you know, the corner turns. I'm starting to win these matches, and it's like, wow, hard work's really paying off right now. And you know, I'm, I'm beating all these like sighted kids, like this little blind kid. Like it felt good, you know. Uh, I, um, so seventh grade, summer ends, I'm going to eighth grade and it's time for wrestling. I go, I end up doing unbelievable. I think uh, I went 24 and one and won the entire like Tri-County Championship, all the middle school stuff that you can win. And it was just like night and day, you know? And in that last match in the championship, I was losing 13 to four with about 30 sec 45 seconds left. And the guy, uh, I go and throw the kid, I throw him to his back and I end up pinning him. And his dad came up to my dad afterwards and said, because of when I, because I'm blind wrestling sighted kids, they have to stay in contact with me at all times. So when we break away, I don't know where you are. So like I could get hurt. So we start back in the middle. And the dad thought this was unfair and said, you know, your son has an unfair advantage. Um, he should go and try a different sport. He should go be in the Special Olympics. He doesn't belong in wrestling. All these things and, and you know, like, I grew up with like being blind, tough shit, you better figure it out. Like, and so like for someone telling me because you're blind, you can't do it, like, it was a shocker to me. And you know, I, I didn't let it affect, it, it bothered me, but I didn't let it take over. And it's eighth grade and, and I'm trying to find where I'm going to high school. I have a handwritten letter of acceptance from the school that both my brothers went to, named Christian Brothers Academy in New Jersey. And it's a very good old boys school, and you know I'm so excited. I'm wearing the wrestling sweatshirt. So excited to go there and wrestle. You know, looking up to my brothers. Uh, that Christmas in eighth grade, the president who wrote the letter of acceptance died, and they sent another letter saying, actually, my mom like just on the trailer received a phone call saying Anthony's no longer accepted into Christian Brothers Academy. Uh, he won't fit into the culture or the environment. We don't want to have to make accommodations for him, so on and so forth. And this, like, as a kid in eighth grade, you know, like, it was my real shock of like, oh wait, life isn't fair all the time. Like, uh, I guess I gotta keep going. I mean, I could have sat there and felt sorry for myself, and you know, just given up. 
because it was, I'll tell you, when I found out, I went home, punched a hole in my wall, like I was devastated. And, uh, you know, I just kept my head down, I kept working hard, I put all my frustration into wrestling. Finally, I get picked up by this guy from St. John Vianney High School who's really interested in me. And, you know, going from a place where you almost have to beg to get into a place where they're trying to get you in there, it's like, it, it's such a blessing. So having this uh, happen to me, it, it really helped my, you know, confidence. But with that being said, I'm going to a school now where I don't know a single person. I'm the only blind kid, and it's scary. Like, I'm... I'm I tried for a little while to hide my blindness. Um, I, I wouldn't use a cane in high school, so I would like just, you know, I'd walk really slow, use my feet, and have my head down, and I would try to put my braille books under my desk and like act like like no one knew, you know, but it's, it's pretty hard to fake being blind in a So I kept going in high school, I just, I kept working so hard, just wrestling, 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 and I started making a name for myself. Like my freshman year, I went 19 and five on varsity. Uh, sophomore year, I ended up like becoming the first ever sophomore varsity captain, and I won the district championship when everyone was saying I wouldn't win anything. All these things, and you know, uh, while I was wrestling and making a name for myself, people were getting uh, a little upset because I was winning and I'm blind. So they would say things like, you know, you're faking it, uh, you have an unfair advantage. One time someone told my dad I was faking it, and while they were saying that, I was falling over the bleacher. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really funny how like, ignorant some people could be. And, you know, it would get to me. Like, I, I have great hearing, so during a match, like, <laughs> coaches, would, coaches would say stuff, like, knowing that I could hear it, but they knew it would get to me. So. You know, there's something I had to overcome growing up and like something, you know, maturity kind of took over once I hit senior year. Of, you know, being sports and like, like you can, you can like bad mouth me all you want, but I'm still gonna beat you. <laughs> like, it's, it's okay. And then you, you know, you compose yourself, you walk off with a smile, shake his hand, and it's the end of the day. And um, while this was going on, my brother Oliver, he was in film school and he saw, you know, me working my butt off and he saw me as this blind wrestler, you know, dealing with adversity and, and you know, having to overcome some obstacles. So he said, hey, you know, we got to do something with this. Like, he took a, a two minute video of me in my room just talking about what it was like to be a blind wrestler, a blind teenager just growing up dealing with adversity and, and some of the things I've had to deal with. And after I won my districts my junior year in high school, uh, my coach posted this, and his teammate from college, Chris Sikorsky, saw it and said, you know, what's going on with this? This is a great story. Like, uh, what is he doing with it? And he ended up meeting with my brother, and they sat down and decided, you know, we're going to out of pocket fund uh, his senior year. We're going to follow him around and do a full feature length documentary. And that's exactly what they did my entire senior year. They followed me around with cameras, and thankfully I couldn't see them. So. <laughs> um, but they, they did, and they got some really raw moments. Like, there's some parts in the film uh, that it's, it's really heart-wrenching. Like, I look back at some of those and to see, like, some of the pressure I was under and, you know, just some of the things that dealt with it, it's like, it's gut wrenching, and it's like, oh wow, you know, it came a long way. And um, they followed me around in my senior year. I was trying to break the record of wins for high school, for my high school. I was trying to, you know, break all these records. And um, my after my senior year was finished, you know, it goes by. The film kind of they filmed everything, and it got put on the shelf. So. They're dealing with like, Chris of course he got married, had a kid, my brother Oliver bought a house. So they're dealing with other stuff and he's working full time somewhere else. And 2015 um, comes along and Chris is you know sitting there and he's like, I gotta take this film off the shelf. There's, some, there's a story here, I need to do this. And he does, he, he starts messing around with it and he puts together the first 10 minutes. And he loves what he has, you know, he's like, this is gonna be a great story, like we still have something here, blah, blah, blah. And he, he schedules to meet with my brother uh, two days later. 
And the next day, uh, my brother, my idol, like my best friend, figure in life, he was 27 years old, passed away of a drug overdose. And he never got to see any of the film that he created. And um, when this happened, he, uh, Chris came to my brother's funeral and vowed to my family that, you know, whatever it takes, he's gonna finish this film for me, for my brother, for my family, for everyone. And that's exactly what he did in the next 16 months. He completed the film, it was an hour and a half long, uh, full feature length documentary. So the next step was, you know, we had to raise money for the completion of the film. He put it on Kickstarter with the story, you know, about my brother. And uh, when this, he, he made a trailer and put it on Kickstarter and the people, we asked for $36,000 and we thought, you know, maybe we'll raise it, maybe not. We ended up raising that in four days and six hours and we raised $85,000 by the end of the month. And while this was going on, the, the trailer received about a million and a half views through people on Facebook, uh, just all over social platforms. And it was, you know, it was overwhelming the, the love and things you were getting from everyone, strangers, and giving money and just the comments. And while this was going on, you know, my, my mother was really having a hard time. And I, you know, the loss of her son, my brother, uh, she, I came home one night to find her at the bottom of the stairs. Um, she had fallen down the stairs and uh, bashed her head in and, and suffered a traumatic brain injury where she was in a coma for two months. And this was just another like blow, like, you know, when life hits, it really hits you hard. And the, like, once again, it was, you're faced with this decision, like, do I just give up or do I keep going and, and know that things are gonna get better? And while this is happening, you know, I'm kind of feeling sorry for myself and just sitting at home, not knowing what I'm going to do. And seeing all the stuff with the film, I'm like, you know, this, I want to like fight again or something. Like, this is, I want to train for something like that. And, you know, I, I'm sitting at my house and I receive a phone call, like, ring, ring, hello. And they're like, hi, is this Anthony Farrar? I'm like, yeah, they're like, this is so and so from the United States Olympic Committee. And I was like, you have the wrong number, I'm sorry. <laughs> And uh, they're like, actually, I, I don't. Um, do you, we uh, were contacting you because we saw your trailer, and if you have any of that talent left from wrestling, unfortunately, wrestling is no longer in the Paralympics, but judo is, which is the next best thing and closest to it. It's basically wrestling with a jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> so. The first thing I know is like, I have to think about this, and I hung the phone up and I, I, I called Mike Melanconico, the guy that raised me to wrestling, and I was like, Mike, I just got a call from the United States Paralympic Committee about judo. He said, like, shut the hell up and go do it. And I, was like, I was like, yes, sir. And I hung the phone up and I called back and I was like, I, I'm going to do it. So the past three years I've been training in uh, Paralympic judo. I, I've you know, won nationals, I've made the United States Olympic world team, and I just got back from competing in Peru at the Pan American Games, and uh, I've been around the country, around the world, a few different countries now, and placed in a few tournaments, and right now I'm ranked about uh, number one in the country, and then top 20 in the world currently, and uh, things are just going really well. You know, the tools that I've learned to like, you know, sometimes you just gotta take risks and go for something, and at first it's going to be really challenging but the fact that you have this much time like space to grow it should be exciting and to get to that top and then when you're at the top you know people are going to try to break down but you just kind of stay there <laughs> and, uh,
calculate maybe 30 to 40 percent of our crowd here is parents. Wow. And as I was listening to your talk, perhaps others identified with the same emotion of the school process. My son is a ninth grader. So we just went through the high school process. Um, and the trauma that that brings on a young person's life, I, I certainly experienced it. What's your, and you went through so much during that period as a young man. Where did, you, where did it come from? Where did your strength come from? I think it came from my mom. Um, I really had no choice but to be strong. <laughs> Because she was like, okay, you're blind, but I'm not treating you any differently than any other of my kids. Because in order, I'm not going to baby you. Because if I baby you, you're just going to, you're not going to grow as fast. And she kind of, you know, threw me in the whirlwind of like, I remember when I was a kid, if, if I wanted, you know, I'd be at a store, like a toy store or something, I wanted this toy. She'd be like, all right, here's $10, go find the counter and pay for it. And I'd be like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know where that is, and I'm really scared, and you know, right. just figure it out. So, so just continuing on the parenting theme, there's so much right now with the, the public crisis around that college admissions crisis that reveals that bravery can crumble sometimes when parents are trying to protect their children. What advice do you give to the parents in the room and future parents or um, people who are close to young people how to raise great children? Um, well, one thing is labels are limiting. So if you label your kid like, oh, he can't do that, or they, they won't be able to do that. How do you know that if they don't try it first? Like, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to fail to be able to succeed. So, you know, you fall down nine times, you get up 10. So okay. it's really like, you know, my mom talks about raising her kids to fly the coop. So it's like, do you want your kid to be at home for the rest of your life? Or <laughs> do you want him to go, to go you know, live their life and, and become something? So it's like letting them take risks too and stepping back a little bit. Right. Anthony, right now, what gives you most hope? Um, it's kind of like Jesse said, the, uh, the children of today. Are they, nothing impacts me more than a group of children that are just positive and you know seeing them help each other work hard and they really are the future of this country and you know the world thank you and just so we all can keep an eye on your progress um when is the next stage in terms of the Olympics? uh so my next major tournament is uh, in montreal january 12th i believe and it's the pan american championships yeah. where if I place in this tournament, I will essentially go right to the Olympics. So. When you place in yeah. this tournament. <laughs> <laughs> um, just last thing, uh, if you want to follow my journey, you can just go to asfvision.com and it has links that link out to everything. So thank you so much for everything. <laughs>